Hey guys, it's Jay Steven here, and today I want to talk a little bit about some historical errors in the film Braveheart. Now, Braveheart, I remember when it came out back in the 90s and I was a kid, it was one of my favorite movies. I loved it. And to this day, it is still one of my favorite movies. I think it's got some great ideas in it about loyalty, courage, honor, that sort of thing. Uh, it does have some historical errors in it, though, and we can use those today as an opportunity to discuss the medieval world. So let's jump into that. So number one for me, the clothing and equipment of William Wallace and his friends. Probably one of the most glaring problems, well, the kilts. Wallace and his buddies are all running around in kilts. And of course, in the modern world, this is a solid image of Scottish identity. However, kilts really weren't widely used until the 17th century. And Wallace and his companions would not have been wearing kilts. Another problem, of course, is sort of the Dark Age-esque clothing and equipment that they're wearing and using. They really don't look like knights and soldiers in the high Middle Ages or late Middle Ages. I suppose this was done in the film to contrast them with their English enemies. But the truth is that they would have been dressed very much like the English soldiers we see in the film are more like them. They would have been wearing chain mail, using helmets, uh, pants, <laughs> certainly not running around with these kilts and, and these braids and uh, these big round ninth century looking shields. And that brings me to another issue and that is their haircuts. They kind of have these heavy metal looking haircuts, you know, the little braids in the side and the mullets and that kind of thing. And it, it really doesn't look like uh, we can imagine that um, Scottish knights would have worn their hair in that way. And another problem, I suppose, is just the fact that William Wallace and his buddies all look so uh, dirty. And, and this is, I suppose, meant to emphasize that they are upstarts, that they are poor, and they are coming up against this more wealthy and powerful, bullying English army. But in fact, the Scottish nobility were a lot like the English nobility. I mean, these were nobles, and they had people who could help them out with things like grooming and uh, you know, getting their hair combed and that sort of thing. They had servants. Number two for me is going to be the character Isabella of France. Now, the actress who plays Isabella in the film is absolutely beautiful, and there's no complaints on that end, but the way she's portrayed in the film is is pretty inaccurate. Uh, we've got, um, for one thing, she, she's the daughter of Philip IV of France. And uh, she gained this reputation in English history as the she-wolf of France. She was born in 1295, and William Wallace died in 1305. So you can see the extreme timeline problem here. Isabella of France would have been a very small child at best during, you know, any part of William Wallace's life. Now, in reality, of course, she did engage in a rebellion against her husband, who was the King of England, Edward II, and that is uh, Edward Longshank's son, shown as kind of the effeminate, uh, ineffectual guy in Braveheart. And so it is true that she came into conflict with him. Um, she had an affair with an English nobleman who was living in exile in France, Roger Mortimer. And together they engineered a coup that brought about the downfall of Edward II. Number three on my list is Prima Nocta. So there's this idea presented in Braveheart that when one of the Scottish peasants marries, his wife is taken to the bedchamber of the local English lord, and there he takes her virginity before she's given back to her husband. And Longshanks is shown as instituting this, and he says this is a method for basically a eugenic type thing uh, to breed out the Scots. And there is just no historical basis for this idea of prima nocta, the idea that a medieval lord would be able to take his peasants' uh, wives and, uh, you know, enjoy them carnally and then, you know, dump them back on his, uh, on his peasants is just an insane idea. And I think it's one that belongs a lot more to the modern imagination's conception of totalitarianism. In the modern world, 
you know, the 20th century, for example, we really have these examples of states with this absolute type of power where they can really just come down hard on the population and seriously oppress them. And the truth is that in the medieval world, really hardcore oppression in the way we think of it was not necessarily possible. Because, you know, you've got a situation where populations could rebel and they could overthrow a government. And so there was a more careful balance between ruling elites and their underlings. Um, in the case of medieval peasants, there were certain obligations that a lord had toward them and vice versa. The peasants had obligations to their lord. And the idea that a population of peasants would have ever to tolerated their basically being all turned into a bunch of cuckolds is just, uh, it's, it's just ridiculous. There's just no evidence that medieval lords ever did anything like this. And I think it would have been a formula for instant rebellion. This is just the kind of thing you, you could not violate without enraging a population of people. And it's just the sort of thing that it would have never occurred to, to a medieval lord to do. And the church would have complained, of course. I mean, we're talking about, you know, the medieval Christian world. This is the sort of sexual sin, you know, that would have just absolutely enraged the church and would have uh, brought the, the wrath of the church down upon any nobleman who tried to impose such a thing. I'd like to take a moment here to read a couple of short reviews for my novel of the Crusades, Why Does the Heathen Rage? This one is from Nelson. Nelson says, the book is well-researched and has a very compelling story. Anyone who likes medieval literature will enjoy this book. Well, thank you very much, Nelson. I appreciate that. And the next review I'd like to read is from Peter Gibney. Peter says, loved every minute of the book, read the whole thing in two days, couldn't stop turning the pages. I'd love to see a sequel for Sir Robert of Burris. Well, thanks so much, Peter. I really am glad you liked the book, and I appreciate that review. If you'd like to pick up a copy of my novel, you can do that by clicking the link down below. All right, my number four historical issue with Braveheart is going to be the portrayal of William Wallace as a peasant farmer. Now, one thing about Braveheart is I think there is a lot of imagery in it that almost seems to owe to ideals from the story of American independence, like the American Revolution and the ideal of the peasant farmer or the farmer rising up and taking up arms against a tyrannical state, a tyrannical power. And I think this obscures the reality of the medieval world. William Wallace was himself a knight. He was somebody who came from the minor nobility. So he would have had a knight's education and training. He would not have grown up living in a shack somewhere. And there is a bit of an allusion to this in the movie, the idea that this Uncle Argyle comes by and... Uh, educates him in Latin and that sort of thing, but it's, it's inconsistent with what Wallace's life would have actually been like. I mean, this is somebody who would have lived supported by a peasant population. He would have grown up as a nobleman. Number five for me is going to be the fact that Edward I of England in this film, Edward Longshanks, his army is shown as wearing these matching uniforms. So the idea is you've got these English soldiers running around, you know, garrisoning uh, fortified positions in Scotland and oppressing the local population. And they're all wearing kind of these orange outfits to mark them off as this is, you know, Edward the First guys. And I think this kind of obscures the reality of how medieval armies functioned in the in the feudal world. Today, you know, we're very used to the idea of these pro professionalized armies. You know, they are an arm of the state. The state funds them, issues them uniforms and equipments, and sends them out to different uh, stations and positions and that sort of thing. But this is just not how the medieval world functioned. Now, the way it worked, of course, is that the King of England, like Edward I, of course, he had his own military household, his, his own lands that uh, produced wealth for him. But the bulk of his army would have been a feudal army. So it would have been his vassals and their resources coming together and acting as, as a body, you know, uh, 
play, uh, playing out their military duties to their lord, their overlord, who is Edward I of England. And so, you know, these, these various vassals who were underneath King Edward, they had, they owed loyalty to him. They owed military service to him. But they owed it not as like, okay, well, now you are Edward I's crony. They still had their own distinct identities and family um, family insignia and that sort of thing. So what they would have worn, of course, would be the colors of their particular family's insignia, their banner. So anyway, these are just some of my issues that I always have noticed with historical problems with uh, Braveheart. Hope you guys enjoyed this little discussion. Of course, I'm, I'm not dissing Braveheart at all. I, I do think it's a fun movie. I've, I've always liked the movie. In fact, I think historical errors in films are just kind of a, a nice opportunity for us to, to learn something about the actual history. So hope you all enjoyed this, and I will talk to everybody soon. And if you liked the music that's featured in this podcast, it's from my CD, Scatheless. You can pick up a copy by clicking the link below. Sweat.